Welcome back to our Conversations podcast. Here I am today with Christian Narut, who is working on or with, should I rather say, goats. Welcome, Christian. Hi. Hi, Joe. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me to a podcast. Um, most welcome. So, Christian, so you and I, we, we get to know each other from um, uh, Open Science Community, which is called the Open Science MOOC, which still exists today and was inaugurated a couple of years ago. And that's how we met, um, was it two years ago now, we're discussing open science and how it can be applied in ethology, where your work environment as well. And, um, and we were conceptualizing about a paper or some article on introducing open science principles to the etholo ethology community. And then, yeah, for some one for several reasons, probably as life sometimes gets in between, we lost touch. But in the meantime, you kept working on this idea, which was originally also yours, um, to to work with your colleagues on articles on open science and goals. But before we get to start about that in particular, would you would you like would you please share with us like what your specific research focus is with goats um what your ambitions are like where your working environment where what institutes you work at and yeah so we get to know you a little bit better yeah sure um hi my name is christian uh, i'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the research institute for farm animal biology located in dummersdorf which is close to rostock at the baltic sea um I have been previously uh, working at Queen Mary University as a research fellow, and I did my PhD at the University of Halle. Uh, and before that, I did my diploma thesis at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary uh, Biology, uh, Evolutionary Biology uh, in uh, Leipzig um, on great apes. Um, so right now, I'm working with farm animals. Uh, in particular, I'm working with goats. <laughs> Uh, and my main aim, basically, um, in this respect is to better understand how farm animals uh, perceive the environment, how they interact with the environment. And this does not only include the physical environment, that means how can they physically comprehend uh, the, the husbandry context, but also, for example, how they interact with humans and uh, what knowledge do they have about humans and how humans behave, for example. Well, wow, that's really interesting. Being a dog owner on my on my own and knowing that dogs have been domesticated like I don't know, is it hundreds or thousands of years ago by now? Um, I think at least one, anyways, quite a long time. And then farm animals like cattle and goats and chickens have been around humans also for a long time. So that's really like it's a research area I haven't even thought of. And yet now that you mention it, it's like it's super interesting to dig into like how do these animal species who work so closely with us and also have been bred into what they are today to serve us with with nutrition and meet our dairy products um how they perceive us that's super interesting um why did you choose goats in particular from the range of farm, farm animals available that's a rather long story i tried to 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 have it quite short uh, here for the podcast. So uh, for my diploma thesis, I was working actually with great apes. So uh, I, I investigated decision-making, great apes, risk-taking in, in primates, uh, which I found extremely interesting. So I was confronted with this whole cognitive approach and how to conduct cognitive experiments with animals. Um, and I wanted to pursue this during my PhD thesis. So I was looking for places where I could uh, run experiments, uh, uh, cognitive behavioral experiments with animals in general. And for some reason, I ended up at the University of Halle uh, because um, uh, they're at the um, uh, Department for Animal Science. They offered a PhD position. Uh, I applied for that. And my idea was that the things that I've learned what has been done with primates and what you can do with primates in terms of uh, conducting cognitive experiments 
uh, I wanted to apply this to farm animals because doing the literature review for the primate studies, I soon realized that there is not a lot of literature in this regard on farm animals. Um, you already mentioned dogs. Uh, there is a plethora of research on dog cognition uh, for various reasons. Uh, there are many labs in the world that work on this topic. But surprisingly, there was very little and still is very little research on farm animals. So I was uh, happy, but also surprised that, that I got this position. Uh, I proposed to run first experiments on um, cognitive experiments with farm animals. And I actually choose pigs to work with. Um, uh, again, long story short, facilities were not adapted to run studies with pigs. So this took a lot of time to, to have a test arena, to have a test set up for the pigs. And in the meantime, I was visiting uh, some small sanctuaries, uh, farm animal sanctuaries uh, near Leipzig or Dresden. Uh, and there I was confronted with goats or with a lot of goats there as well. Uh, and I thought, well, let's try goats. Maybe it's it's easier to work with goats than with pigs. Uh, if you have worked with pigs or if you're familiar with pigs, it can be quite tricky, for example, uh, to let them focus on visual cues. So they are really uh, olfactory and acoustic motivated. So it's really hard if you, for example, want to show them something in a test environment, for example, where a reward of food is hidden, it's really hard to get their attention if you only focus on visual cues. So I thought maybe goats might work better on this regard. Uh, and indeed they did. So it was relatively easy to train the goats to indicate a choice. If you have, for example, two cups and they have to choose one of these cups, and they really pay a lot of attention uh, in the visual domain. So this made it really easy to work with them. Uh, I, in no time, became a big fan of goats. Um, and uh, at, or I think at least when I went to Queen Mary University, there I worked at a sanctuary for goats uh, or collected data at a sanctuary for goats. Um, from that point on, basically, my focus, my main focus was on goat research and here in particular on how goats interact and communicate with humans. So that's basically the, the long short story, how I went from primates to pigs to goats. Uh, a lot of luck and a lot of coincidence, I guess, but uh, I never regretted it. Mm. So pigs are also known to be super smart animals. Um, like. Would you say the same about goats, which are commonly referred to as not as smart as other species, whatever you compare it to? I mean, I don't know if this is even, a fair, in my opinion, is not a fair measure, really, but just because there is a lot of, well, of what's the word, um, common misconceptions in various societies about animals that we live with and um, is like in, in my ideal world, it's or in my anticipation and assumption, it's that animals are perfectly adapted, like us humans, to their specific work environments and needs that they have due to their um, anatomical uh, setup. Um, so, but what would you, from your experience in working with goats, and also have having worked with great apes and pigs for some time, or considered looking into it in more depth? Is there anything that's comparable that you can apply a measure of intelligence or um, anything like that to the animals? Um, I think you've got it already quite good in a way that it's it wouldn't be a fair comparison in most regards. Uh, there's this famous cartoon where uh, a, a person asked a fish to climb and wants to measure the fish's ability to climb and says, well, you can't climb, you're not smart enough to climb. Um, it's um, it's in many, many cases just the case that uh, we as humans look with our abilities, with our environment that we grow up on the abilities of animals and then judge them according whether they are similar to us or not. So we might think that you know, pigs are indeed extremely fast learners. So we might think that pigs uh, appear smarter to us because they can learn very quickly uh, to adapt to new environments. But this is exactly what they do in the wild. They are omnivore, they are uh, opportunistic, uh, so they try to exploit as many food sources as possible. Uh, and they have to learn really quickly what they can eat, what they cannot eat, which uh, food they have to disregard, where are new 
to that, they have to remember uh, foot patches throughout their area. Uh, and these foot patches are often under the ground as well. So it's uh, it's just, uh, it's a, there's a reason why they are such good learners. Uh, goats are good learners as well, but, and we never did a fair comparison mm -hmm. either, but uh, in my personal opinion, they learn a little bit less fast than, than the pigs do. But uh, again, this is just uh, because of their, their, their uh, natural habitat. So there is, no such strong need to be an extremely fast learner because uh, on, on the other side, having the cognitive capacities or having the mental capacities to, to memorize a lot and to learn a lot also means that you have to put energy in this. So it's, there's always a trade off between the uh, mental capacities that animals have and to which degree they are uh, uh, expressed in them. Um, so yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's a fair comparison, uh, not just to compare primates with pigs, but also just to compare pigs with, with goats, because they differ extremely in terms of their um, ecology uh, or ecological background and natural foraging ecology. Yeah, thanks for that. And also, like, maybe to draw just one more comparison on two animal species that seem very similar as sheep and goats. I think I found this in your reference list or your some one or the other of your own research articles is that when you compare the two, they differ drastically in the way they conceive information and process information, even though they look almost the same. And what I learned from the article is that if you look back into what natural habitat they have, it's totally different. Like sheep are presumably stupid from our observations as humans and what we deem intelligent, whereas those goats seem more intelligent and clever and agile or whatever, or solution oriented. But then if you, yeah, as you say, like if you consider the natural habitat and the evolutionary aspects and the physical conditions, like despite the uh, mere um, look and phenotype for the outer appearance, then it's clear that they, of course, are different species and they also have different skills and um, assets, which are not comparable one to the other. Do you want to um, ex extrapolate on that a little bit or is that enough? Yeah, I, mean, that yeah I, can, I can just uh, try to, to, uh, to give a quick recap on this. So uh, indeed we had uh, two studies where we wanted to compare goat behavior and sheep behavior. And I think the main message behind this is that goats appear to be in certain contexts more flexible in terms of their learning, uh, which we uh, try to explain uh, in a way that uh, goats are in their feeding ecology, um, they are more picky eaters basically than sheep. So uh, for sheep, you would have a, a lawn or meadow and th that's fine for them. They, they, uh, they can rely on grass all the time while goats rely very often also on uh, fresh leaves, stems, uh, and other more energetic uh, uh, plant resources or plant sources. Uh, and for those, you have to basically, you have to be a bit more flexible. You have to remember where these were located, where you have to go to, uh, and uh, you have to make different decisions than, for example, the food is just dispersed below your feet, for example. So this is why we try to explain or how we try to explain this difference that we found between two, the two species. But this is just one explanation. They are also, they look quite similar. There are many other differences like their social structure or the, or the, the, the cohesion in the social group. So um, sheep tend to stick more together. So they lump together when they are running away, for example, while this is more our impression. If if goats run away, they disperse. It's not that they clinch together, or most of the time clinch together. They try to to go different routes sometimes. Um, so there are other factors as well that might be at play in this. Um, but uh, yeah, one of the one of the main things because you mentioned that uh, coming back to the start that goats or sheep are, might not be perceived as very clever by. Uh, uh, in the public or by society. I think one of these reasons is that uh, they are prey animals. And when you uh, walk nearby them, they they see all oh, something is moving, they stand still and then they just look at you. And I think this gives easily the impression that 
they do not know what to do right now. They don't make a decision. They don't make a, an action in this regard. So they're, they're just waiting for you to do something. This might give the impression that they are not very proactive in their behavior uh, and in turn might not be perceived as very intelligent, at least to what we would perceive as intelligent as humans. Um, but uh, I think the thing that we completely miss is what is going on in their, in their uh, brain, basically, when they are standing still and observing what's going on. So what are they calculating? What are they processing? What they are, uh, what, what they may anticipating? What comes next? So this is something that we do not see and that we have to infer from, for example, behavioral experiments. Yeah, I suddenly had a funny thought, as you mentioned this, and the alleged uh, the comparison with the goalkeeper. So while they're processing and anticipating what the next move of the predator might be, they're probably outsmart um, goalkeepers like by by huge scales <laughs> in <laughs> being able to to read in the in the enemies or the other leagues team what's going to happen next after doing such a thorough study on that. <laughs> um, so. Coming towards the topic of open science, what does open science mean to you and in your particular research field? Um, I try to explain this in a more chronological order. Um, I think for me, open science at the very beginning meant that uh, it helps us as researchers, in particular in our field, uh, when we do uh, experiments or behavioral experiments with animals and basic research, that we can better disseminate this research and that we've been uh, with this better dissemination we can better explain this research so it's it's uh, open it's visible to everyone uh, everybody can read about this and it's a better justification why we are doing this research and we as researchers have the opportunity basically to explain ourselves better why this research is needed and even if it's, if it's basic research how it can be uh, for example, applied somewhere in the future. So we can justify why we have to do this research. And I think this is something that is crucially important, in particular when we mainly rely on basically taxpayer money when we are conducting this research. So this is the, the, the basically the key argument that I came from before I actually really thought about open science as a whole. It's like, uh, as, a, as a whole, it's like, uh, it was mainly the point of dissemination. And from that point on, when I walked more into the whole topic, uh, I, I uh, found more and more arguments that I thought that this is, the, that are more and more relevant for our research here as well. Like, uh, uh, yeah, like like thinking about your, your research plan before you start the experiments, having clear hypothesis, justifying your sample size, uh, having probably your, your test protocol peer reviewed before you start, before you actually um, use or, yeah, an exclamation mark, use your animals in the experiment. Um, so having quality control or more quality control before you start the experiment, uh, I think are crucial parts that need to be implemented further uh, in our field in particular. Thank you. And um, so talking about sample sizes, how many gods do you currently work with? to have some goatee aspect on this topic again. Um, this, this usually uh, depends on the accessibility. So we have, a, uh, we have a facility where we house the goats here at the Institute. Um, and when we conduct studies, we usually rely on, let's say from uh, 10 to 40 animals. Uh, this highly depends on the test schedule and basically how many researchers are involved because we can only test so and so much goats uh, in one day or in one week. Um, and right now uh, in a new test paradigm that we are trying to pilot, we just run with six goats where we want to see whether this, uh, how they behave in the new paradigm and how this might work. So, but usually we, we, we are somewhere between 10 or 40 individuals. Okay. Um... How, how are open science practices and what the open science community at large is trying to accumulate as knowledge and best practices, how is this informing your current and ongoing research? Is, like, do you see that you can draw from this and apply like 
But I'm sure there's plenty, but if you could just give one or two examples of how open science practices inform and possibly also improve your research, besides what you already mentioned in having a more thorough project planning um, to start with, and then what else can it inform your research with? Um, the the one thing that that bugs me right now the most is that uh, I'm, I'm talking uh, in these articles that you mentioned as well. I'm talking about registered reports or pre-registrations, uh, and uh, I'm going to implement this uh, doing the next experiments. But this can be particularly hard for exploratory research for pilot studies where you do not know what to do next. Um, so. Um, pre-registrations, I think, are one crucial element that needs to be adapted in our field of applied pathology. Um, but what I thought informed me as well the uh, most was just learning about why pre-registrations are necessary. So this led one thing to another, like, uh, as I mentioned, thinking about uh, justifications for sample sizes, thinking about clear hypothesis at the very start, something that is that is clear uh, for, for every researcher, but uh, that uh, just digging into the literature basically and, and reading why it's really important to stick to these hypotheses and why it's really important to, uh, to stick to, the, to your research plan uh, uh, as a justification or, or, or as a measure for more robust research at the end. Um, for people who work with animals, in particular with farm animals or domestic animals, uh, they know that that often, if you conduct research, these plants can diverge over the course of time because animals don't behave as you expect, or you have to adjust the setup a little bit. So I understand that it's difficult to stick to your research plan. But uh, the more I read about pre-registrations and why it's important, the more I try to implement this, not just simply as a pre-registrations, but also in my thinking about uh, novel test designs, uh, novel test protocols, and how they have to be set up. So, um, yeah, this this kind of shaped a lot of my thinking about how research is supposed to be conducted versus uh, how research is sometimes also conducted in a more exploratory way. Uh, but yeah, people like narratives, so it's always interesting or, or more interesting to to have a fitting narrative to exploratory research, but I, yeah, it, it, it took some, it took a while to, to get some inner knowledge on this. And my experience is also that some of the skeptics um, always argue with academic freedom, like you said, explorative research, like I cannot come with a plan because we're here to do research and to learn on the go. I think, uh, I think both approaches are valid and maybe both can meet in between. And to my understanding, pre-registrations and registered reports are also not enshrined in stones. In stone, that I, that's what I usually convey in my courses. Also, they are meant to change along the way. So, of course, if you make a discovery, or if you if you find that your hypothesis is difficult to come by because there's not enough animals to work with, or whatever other constraint you experience despite your expectations and thorough planning, then of course there should be room for flexibility and agile approaches to reassess the situation and to make best possible use of the resources, including the funding and also the animals that we work with, um, as well as human capacity, equipment and other things. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's interesting to hear from you how this is actually informed and allowed you to also learn how methodology and um, also the use of the, how many animals do we actually need for this question to find answers to over of the course of the project how how thinking presumably only about re pre-registering the study making a plan for it um, which is often is also required by funders <laughs> in more or less detail but that it also informs methodology and basically saves time and money at the end of the day or at, towards the end of the project. And that's in my observation, especially crucial also in my personal experience for limited, timely limited research projects like PhD studies, 
or otherwise um, timed project activities. Um, um, re regarding the methodologies and also statistical analyses, um, is there anything that the open science approach has helped you there as well? Um, what I've found very valuable for, for our own research approach or for working with animals uh, where you have restricted resources uh, uh, in terms of times and the number of animals that you have. I think thinking about your statistical analysis plan uh, and your or your, your um, test design, whether you're using a between subject design or within subject design, what are the advantages of the one and the other, uh, and which statistical approach you want to use uh, when you want to analyze the, the data that you will collect, uh, I think helped me personally a lot to, um, to, to improve my own approach to the research that I'm doing uh, in terms of that I'm spending way more time uh, trying to get all of this straight before I starting to collect data or before I actually go into the barn and, and conduct the experiments um, because it helps me at the end after I have the data collected. Uh, uh, I, I already know what I want to do with this data. I, am, I do not uh, just out of a sudden uh, um, confronted with a with an aspect that I, I missed some crucial parameter that I should have measured doing this just because I did not thought it really through and what I really want to get out of the whole thing. Uh, so this this really helped me in my own approach. So this is, uh, I think, something that is extremely valuable, um, not just for the sake of having a pre registration, but uh, just for uh, the scientific uh, work that we're doing in general. Yeah, and this is totally in line also with the FAIR principles. I uh, just want to explain that just briefly. To make research data, in your particular case, it's logical data, like of the behavioral aspects that the goats show to you, um, findable, accessible, interoperable, and also reusable. And that doesn't mean, just for the listeners out there, that doesn't mean that it has to be open and made pu publicly aware. Uh, available, it's um, often the opposite, but it's important for the researcher to have a way to document and to also anticipate results that you collect um, often as a, also as a byproduct and still also keep track of these byproducts because they might prove themselves useful in the future for future analyses and therefore can also be reusable for the very same researcher and research team. Um, once you, no, as, as soon as we progress in our research projects. Um, you've published, as mentioned in our introduction, you've published two articles, particular on the intersection of open science and um, animal research. One is um, from end of October last year, a short primer on the academic, societal, and animal welfare benefits of open science for animal science you um, published together with a colleague and then this year you shared a preprint on the seven steps to enhance open science practices in animal science could you please um in a nutshell what are both articles what are the take-home messages of both articles where the letter one um says it on title there's seven guidance steps but and also on a second answer approach, um, what was the feedback received so far from the um, animal science community or the ethology community? Um, the, the, the whole journey basically uh, started and which also let me myself think more about how these open science practices can impact on animal or applied animal research was uh, at a conference that I visited, I think in 2019, the good old times <laughs> um, where there were still in-person conferences where I met with this uh, colleague, Tobias Krause from the Friedrich Löffler Institute in Celle. And um, after my, my talk, which was about goat behavior, we, for what reason ever, 
started chatting about uh, open access publishing and how this is increasingly common in our field as well and all the other um, or more or less common open science practices and um, we came up with the idea to to draft something together or write something together on how this actually might affect uh, our, our our research and the 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 welfare of the animals that we're using for this research. Um, so this is basically the, the backstory of the first paper. This took a really long time. There were other commitments and we just paused this and uh, at some point resumed writing on this. Uh, so the idea here is to show the connections between open science practices, in particular open access publishing, pre-printing and pre-registrations and how they might have an effect on animal welfare of the animals that we're working with in research. This doesn't necessarily mean that it has an impact on the very animals that we use in, a, in the research that we're doing, but uh, in research in general. Um, just an example, uh, faster dissemination via preprinting or open access publishing can often lead uh, to, the, to the idea that or notion that other researchers became aware of your research that might plan uh, research to answer a similar question like you did. Uh, having it pre-printed, uh, they can already look at the protocol, they can see how this worked for you uh, and what are your results are and can potentially adapt their own protocol to improve it and to not rerun it basically just to make the same errors that you did or to improve it in terms of uh, adding something novel so they're not rerunning uh, your experiment and uh, uh, yeah, uh, basically trying to answer the same question. Um, but there are also other interconnections that we think are worth to discuss, for example, or in particular pre-registrations, where you can get feedback, not just about whether this is an adequate test design that you're using, but also whether you were trying, uh, or whether there are improvements possible in your test design to further refine uh, the environment, the test environment, in order to not compromise welfare of the animals that you're using in your tests, but also whether there are already adequate uh, non-animal models that you could use to answer your research question. Um, so these are the aspects that we're dealing with this uh, within this first preprint. I'm, I'm currently working on the revision of this, so we hope to get this published or peer-reviewed and published uh, over the next weeks. Uh, and the second article kind of came along on the same journey. So writing on this uh, on this topic. Uh, led me to dig deeper into the whole literature uh, and at some point I, uh, Anna Olsen, which is a colleague from the University of Porto, uh, got in contact with me and we kind of uh, run in our field, Applied Ethology, um, two workshops on open science uh, because we realized that a lot of people know about the topic but do not know about the details and in particular do not know about how to implement them. So uh, let's say well, people know what a preprint is, but they never preprinted. So we, for example, were interested. Why you have never preprinted? You know what a preprint is? Why, you don't, why don't you do this? And we were surprised that many people were basically in this workshop saying, we don't know why. why, why uh, we don't know how to do this, basically. We don't know what to do exactly and what we have to take care of and what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages or potential disadvantages. So from these workshops, we came up with the idea, okay, there seems to be a lack of uh, training on this. Why not do a short article about, hey, open science is very valuable for a field, uh, not just because we as researchers can benefit from it, but also the animals that we're working with. So we are proposing in the second article, seven easy steps uh, for animal science researchers that they can implement in their research. We are aware that there are many other resources out there, but we aim to publish this in a journal that is dedicated to animal science uh, and we hope to reach more people in our field and that they then might start or have an easier start uh, implementing these practices as well. Um, just to name a few, um, one thing is of course that, that people should start pre-registering their work, um, but also uh, that they might consider pre-printing uh, some of the other steps are to, uh, for example, for previous research that they have conducted, that they have published, 
not under an open access license that they should be aware that there's this green open access route so they can deposit uh, post print versions of their articles to repositories to make it accessible to everyone and uh, people can actually find the research and are not confronted with a payroll. This is something that many people are actually not really aware of and they're not aware of. And if they are aware of, they are not really aware what are the legal boundaries of this and whether they can do this with the research or with this particular article or not. So we're trying to uh, yeah, give a lot of help and assistance and uh, a lot of resources as well, where people can uh, uh, read and uh, can have a further read to make more informed decisions about this. Thank you for that overview of what's inside these articles and how they came about. We will, of course, list the articles also in the in the show notes and in the blog article that's um, yeah connect, connected to this um, episode. Um, and now, uh, have you received any feedback since you published these online? And by well, except for the feedback that you are directly received in the workshops, have people approached you and gave comments on the recommendations that you disseminated? Um. I think we here uh, basically experience the same as many people do when they publish preprints that feedback is often very limited. So uh, we got uh, some positive feedback in terms of this is necessary. We need to inform people in the field about this uh, in terms of uh, feedback on how to improve this or how to make it more readable or better to comprehend for the reader. Uh, we haven't got feedback such as this. Um, but this is, I mean, this this would basically uh, is going would likely go hand in hand with a better implementation of preprinting, for example, in the publication process in general. So more people are aware about preprints, about the opportunity that they can comment on these preprints or just contact you and write you an email. Uh, so we uh, hope that this will improve in the future as well. Yeah, we I got, think there's... we got very. Sorry, we got very valuable feedback from the reviewers, uh, which is great. So great, this yeah. helped us also to improve the manuscripts. Perfect. And yeah, I mean, on any research article, you have the, often the e email address of the corresponding author, which implies that people are waiting to receive um, readers' comments and feedback. So also for anyone out there reading research articles, preprints, and if you have questions or remarks to make, please get in touch with the authors. They are keen to hear from you. Um, same with Christian and your work here. Have you presented to inform? And if there's any questions, then just ask. Um, I think, well, obviously highly relevant to animal research in particular, maybe not as urgent in your research field of cognitive um, animal research, or, but in other areas um, more so are the three R approach, or, which stands for reduce, replace, refine. Um, have you found ways, I think you already mentioned that in another context in an earlier questions or, or your, um, your responses thereof, but in particular, could you maybe extrapolate a little bit about three R, the necessity, um, why this is an emerging discussion to have in the animal research arena at large, and if at all it applies to your research in particular, if we can make use of any of those concepts. And also probably to what you already said, how it refers back to open science practices like pre-registrations. I think we covered that there as well, but I just wanted to highlight the theorem. Uh, of, of course, these uh, the three R's are are highly relevant for our own research as well. Um, we are mostly conducting non-invasive research. We are most often only measure um, behavioral responses of the animals, but nonetheless, this often means that we uh, have to confront them with uh, more or less stressful situations. For example, when we have to isolate them uh, or if we, for example, want to measure the stress response because we're interested in how stressful a certain event is and see whether in, in treatment or an intervention can reduce the stress. Um, so uh, we are relying on these three principles uh, and uh, we um, 
yeah, we, we, we try to implement it in our research as well, which again comes back to thinking about your statistical design, having discussions with colleagues before you start data collection, uh, trying to go within, within subject design to reduce the number of the animals, um, ideas or considerations how to refine the environment of the animals. So if you expose them to stress, for example, if you want need to, for, for what experimental protocol, whatever, if you need to punish them because they did something wrong or did the wrong choice, find a punishment that is, uh, that is negative, perceived negative, but is not harmful in any way to the animal. Uh, so um, they still learn, but you do not, uh, uh, yeah, you do not decrease their welfare in an unnecessary way. So there's a lot of discussion how we need to better implement this. Um, as behavior or uh, uh, people that work on animal behavior or applied animal behavior, we do not really rely on the uh, on the replacement. Uh, in this regard, because we are actually interested in the behavior of the whole animal. We cannot just replace the whole animal and try to study the behavior of the animal. So this is something that is more the focus of other uh, areas of research, of, of uh, animal research. Uh, but when it comes to refinement and to uh, the reduction in the use of these animals, we, we strongly rely on this. And open science, I think, I mentioned this for the pre registrations, but also with a better dis dissemination via pre printing and open access, that we can uh, try to find synergetic effects between both of those. So, uh, implementing open science because it benefits us as researchers, but it can also, in the same time, benefit the animals that we are using for this research. Yeah. So, what I hear from you and also what I preach myself on courses is that open science is also nothing new, it's good scientific practice. And I usually introduce open science as GSP, good scientific practice in the digital era that we now live in. So there's new concepts, there's new tools, there's new approaches to what we already know and want to pursue as researchers in our own best interest and also in society's welfare and also in this case, animal welfare. Um, and I would like to just briefly um, and maybe towards the concluding remarks, Come back to your sta uh, your statement on corrective measures, or which used to be punishments, to inform the animal. Well, this is not a, what I want you to do, but instead something else. How can we make them realize that? From my own work with horses and natural horsemanship approaches, but also again, like I'm a dog owner, I've come to realize that. Um, of the natural horsemanship approach is based on observing how horses communicate with each other. And when it comes to corrective measures, a good observational setup is mother to child or mother to pub or you know, a child animal. I don't know, <laughs> there's an umbrella term, cross species. Um, uh, and how mother animals correct their children. Um, uh, have you observed anything like that that you can apply in your research for goats or and also like I find it on the other end fascinating how adaptive many animal and especially domestic animal species have become to read our ways to communicate and to learn words which they can speak themselves and learn to differentiate between, differentiate between okay, that's what the human wants me to do. And that's, that's a no, <laughs> like no means no kind of thing. Okay, maybe that's two questions. But first of all, can goats learn human differentiators between yes and no, or um, good and bad? Um, or have you learned to adapt um, behaviors and corrective measures that you've observed in the goats to be more animal and goat friendly in your approach? Um, what we what we most want or most often want to do is to not really interrupt with the behavior of the goats in the group. So there's not really a corrected measure because most often the experimenter is just the outside observer, sometimes in the experiments interacting with the animals in a controlled manner. Um, when I refer to, to potential punishments, uh, it relies on that the animal has to learn over the course of the experiment that something is not rewarded or is even punished, for example. So it should avoid to go there. So there's a, there's a cost to go there. Uh, and this is particularly relevant, for example, 
let's think about a cognitive bias approach where you usually have a rewarded situation and a non-rewarded or punished situation. Uh, one is on the left, the other one is on the right side, and then you will uh, have a position in the middle um, and you want to see how the animal reacts, whether it has an expectation that this is rewarded or whether this is punished. So you need to train the animals beforehand that one position is rewarded, the other one is punished. Uh, so we we do not really want to imply corrected measures in the usual husbandry routine or something like that. Uh, it, it might be warranted at some point because some of the goats can get quite nifty and try to eat your horse, uh, to eat your, not horse, your trousers uh, and your clothes and nibble on this and get can get really, 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 um, well, eager to get rewards from you. But usually we do not try to interfere with that. Uh, when it comes to your second question in terms of goats learning from humans or goats observing humans and whether they can pick up uh, any of this information, uh, we have some first evidence or some first results that they, they actually um, can learn some spatial information from humans. Uh, we need to, at some point, of course, try to replicate this and see whether this also holds true in other contexts. Um, and we have also uh, some studies that show that they can actually, in giving a prior, um, giving prior or previous uh, interactions with humans, that they can also interact with humans in a way that we might have expected to be the case for dogs, let's say five or six years ago, which we did not really expect to see in farm uh, animals in particular, and to this regard as well. Um, let's say uh, the we all know from 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 dogs when you put their toy out of reach they start looking at you and alternate their view between mm -hmm. the toy and you which we indicate as humans as a request for help or a request for assistance mm -hmm. uh, so we were uh, actually really a little bit surprised to see really strong behavioral responses from goats that look almost the same so when we uh, put their food out of reach so they can't reach us themselves uh, they at some point start looking at humans as well it's not as interactive as with dogs because they have way more uh, mimic or mimical options uh, and this is not the case for goats but they show these gaze alternations for example as mm -hmm. well so they're there they might be way more behind these human farm animal interactions than we might have previously believed yeah that's, uh, thanks for sharing that. That's quite insightful and surprising, but maybe not surprising because if we think about it, we all share this planet with thousands and tens of thousands and trillions and millions of animal species from insects to bugs to whatever. Um, and especially when it comes to vertebrates and mammals, I mean, we're very like closely related. So, and, but also to be able to interact on this world and to observe each other like who's friend who's foe of course there needs to be some empathy capacity in various species to learn to read and also to learn to interact with different species so but it's good that we are making progress and in getting insights science-based insights into what's possible what's yeah, so and actually some some research data on these topics. So thanks for sharing that observation as well. Um, yeah, and uh, thanks very much for this conversation. Like I've learned a lot. Um, this is really exciting. Again, for you out there, we will link all the articles and references mentioned in this conversation. And Christian, is there anything else you want to share from your research or anything that's in preparations to be published? Um, regarding open science and animal research. I mean, you mentioned there's a, the paper of this preprint coming soon. Um, and also with your actual on-topic research topics, like what's the next chapter as far as you can tell and anticipate? Is your next um, bigger as a, as, a, as, a, as a closing message, uh, if you work in animal behavior or applied animal behavior, uh, I, I uh, would really really be grateful if you could have a look not just at these articles that are mentioned but in general at open science and how this can actually improve your own research and help you as a researcher as well 
um, in terms of my personal outlook, um, we are, as I mentioned before, we are uh, trying to establish a new behavioral paradigm for the goats. So it's new for goats, not for, for all animals, where we try to rely on looking time uh, and looking duration to video screens. So uh, if you haven't seen it yet, my Twitter handle uh, is goats that stare. So I'm trying to stick to this promise and I hope I can deliver a lot of goat videos with this new paradigm as well with goats looking at the different video stimuli. And hopefully we get better insights um, in terms of their preferences for certain stimuli or their uh, how they anticipate upcoming events, for example. Oh, so as much as we are trying to decrease our our screen time, goats are going to increase theirs, at least to some extent, to give us new insights. Thank you very much, Christian. Thanks um, for having me, Joe, on this podcast. And um, see you all soon again on this channel. Yeah.